Boston Girls. A special hello goes out to the director of media for the Boston Girls alumni, Mr. Mark Boyer. Nice to see you, Marky. Welcome to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, the home of behind-the-scenes interviews, stories, and memories that celebrate the heritage of the great game of hockey. The Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast is hosted by Mark Willand. Our guest, John Van Boxmeer, was a first-round draft pick, 14th overall, by the Montreal Canadiens in 1972. And he went on to an outstanding 10-year NHL career as a high-scoring defenseman with the Habs, Colorado Rockies, Buffalo Sabres, and Quebec Nordiques. John was part of Montreal's 75-76 Stanley Cup powerhouse team, playing behind Hall of Fame defenseman Larry Robinson, Guy Lapointe, and Serge Savard. In search of consistent playing time, he was dealt to the Colorado Rockies in 1976 and established himself as a solid NHL blue liner with an improving but struggling franchise. When Scotty Bowman took over as GM in Buffalo, he acquired John in exchange for Rene Robert, and John delivered seasons of 51, 68, and 69 points from 79-80 to 81-82. By 1984, however, injuries would take their toll, and his playing career ended, but he soon embarked on a successful 25-year coaching career in the NHL, AHL, IHL, and Swiss Elite Leagues. He's now a pro scout with the Buffalo Sabres. John has great insights on his career at all levels and excellent stories to tell. He even recalls his infamous TKO loss to Dave the Hammer Schultz in 1976. Now, as the show continues to grow in popularity, we greatly appreciate your reviews, emails, and feedback. To see the response we've gotten from you, the fans, has been heartening, and we We'll continue to work hard to make the show as entertaining and informative as possible. Remember, you can always find us at ProHockeyAlumni.org or on social media. Our guests have been outstanding, haven't they? What a wonderful experience it has been recording these conversations with the legends who made the game great. They're just super guys and it has been a privilege to talk with all of them. And a privilege to have you fans along for the ride. So thank you very much again. Now, let's talk classic hockey with John Van Boxmeer. We're back on the show with John Van Boxmeer, who enjoyed an excellent NHL career, primarily with Montreal, Colorado, and Buffalo, and went on to a long coaching career, over 30 years in all, of professional hockey involvement as a player and a coach. John, thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. John, growing up in Ontario, I'm assuming that you were a uh, Maple Leafs fan growing up. Was that the case? Did you have uh, a, an early interest in, in playing hockey? Well, definitely. When I grew up in the 50s and 60s, there was Toronto was the only team we got to see on Hockey Night in Canada. You know, you had one game a week on Saturday night. Uh, so I think everybody was a Maple Leafs fan. Mm-hmm. As you progressed through your career uh, at a very young age, was it something you recognized early on that you'd have an opportunity to uh, you know, move on and play junior hockey? When did that become apparent to you that you could have an ability to perhaps play at the next level? You know what? I never really thought uh, about pro hockey till my last year of junior when I started to get uh, some recognition from scouts and things like that. I mean... Uh, before that, I, I was just kind of playing, uh, trying to play as long as I could uh, mm-hmm. until I thought I had to go out and get a real job. So <laughs> it was kind of a surprise to me uh, that I was able, that I did end up being a pro hockey player. Now, you ended up playing the Southern Ontario League, and I was curious, how, what was your first exposure to being First of all, how did you get to play with Guelph, Guelph in that league? How did that come about? And how did you first uh, first know that you were getting noticed by NHL scouts? Well, I, what happened was I had gotten the year before, or in, I think it was 1970 or 69, I got drafted by the Kitchener Rangers mm-hmm. uh, when guys like Larry Robinson and uh, Billy Barber uh, uh, Tom Cassidy, those types of guys were there uh, at the time, and 
you know, back then I was like their fifth defenseman. So in those days, the teams only played four. The fifth guy really didn't play all that much. And, mm-hmm. and like I said, I, you know, I, I just played hockey because I loved to play and it was fun. And, you know, I wasn't playing a whole lot there. And, and I said, hey, you know, if I'm not going to play, I, I'm, I'm going to go back home and I'll play junior B back home. Uh, again, because I didn't, I never thought that I had a hockey career in my future. So I ended up going back home, and and that uh, was the first year of the uh, uh, Tier Two Junior Hockey League. And, and uh, Guelph ended up calling me up and wanted me to come and play for them. And you know, my mom was kind of on me, uh, saying, "Hey, you got a chance to be a hockey player, you know, mm-hmm. go for it." So I ended up uh, really to make my mother happy. I ended up going and. Um, you know, the first year of my year was just so-so, and um, the next season I started out with a really good training camp, and you know, it kind of took off. And uh, I had a couple of offers to go to the OHL, one by Hamilton, the other one was, was the Marlies. Uh, but you know, my GM really wasn't going to give me a release. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I end up staying there playing the year. I, I you know, I end up. Uh, getting a lot of points and, and, you know, scouts started to take notice and come to games. And, you know, I, I had a couple scholarship offers to go to university. And mm-hmm. um, so it just, things just kind of snowballed from there. They sure did. I mean, your career accelerates from going to uh, tier two. All of a sudden, the interesting thing is, is hockey's most uh, prestigious franchise on the verge of a, uh, of a dynastic run in the in the seventies, the Montreal Canadiens draft you or number one, fourteenth overall, nineteen seventy two. Was that a surprise to you? And how did you hear about that? Actually, it was a surprise. Um, I was in, drafted in the first round, but I was their fourth pick in the first round. Oh, that's right. That's right. If you look back, yeah, they had three guys ahead of me: uh, uh, Steve Shutt, Michelle Arock, Dave Gardner. So I was their fourth pick in the first round. Um, and actually, I heard about it. Um, I, I received a phone call. I, I was at work. I worked for uh, my general manager had a car dealership in Guelph, and, and I worked in the parts department there. And, and actually, uh, I got a phone call from the, uh, Mr. Sam Pollock uh, mm-hmm. saying that they had drafted me. And, uh, you know, back then, not that many players went to the draft. Yeah, it was, it was definitely not an event uh, as no, it is, as like it is today. Now. And so, well, I guess the good news is you drafted by the Montreal Canadiens round one. The challenging thing is you drafted by the Montreal Canadiens because, of course, that's not a team anybody's really going to step into right away at that point. And you start out with the Nova Scotia Voyagers, a very strong team. Uh, Yvonne Lambert, you mentioned Michelle LaRock, uh, coaching for, uh, playing for Alan McNeil. Talk to us a little bit about that first year. That's a big jump for you. Actually, you know, I, I got to go back a little bit because something even bigger happens, something incredible happens. You get to be part of that 1972 Summit Series Team Canada team. And I didn't know much about that, about your involvement in that. Could you fill me in on that? How did that all come about? I know Alan Eagleson was your your agent and you, I'm assuming you went to training camp and stayed with the team and traveled all the way through that historic event. Well, um, I mean, first of all, I ended up getting Alan Eagles. I didn't have an agent. Um, and after I got drafted, you know, um, then my, my general manager called, you know, and said, uh, was talking to me. He said, hey, John, you know, you need to get an agent because if you go in and talk to, to Mr. Pollock by yourself, you're going to end up playing for nothing. <laughs> and uh, so he said, let me make a call for you. So he called Alan Eagleson. And, and so Alan took me on. Um, and then Al was running the uh, Team Canada. You know, he was the head of the Players Association. He was the guy that put that super series, series right. together. And so they were looking for uh, three juniors to fill out the roster. And there was there had been a couple of two defensemen that were drafted ahead of me. Jim Schoenfeld went to Buffalo, and uh, Phil Russell went to Chicago. Mm-hmm. But um, you know they had they had a tough time getting players out of Chicago. You know, getting uh, 
guys like uh, Bill White and, and Pat Stapleton and, and Tony Esposito. Uh, so they had trouble getting those guys out of there. So th- I don't think they even tried. Um, and probably because Alan Eagleson was my agent, it kind of was a fit. And so that I went from playing tier two to my first exposure to professional hockey was that training camp of that series in Toronto. Unbelievable. That's amazing. It had to be an incredible feeling just stepping on the ice in practice as a somebody who grew up watching pretty much all of your teammates on television. These are some of the best players in the world at the time. And it's not just a series. It's just not a – it's just not – this is a gigantic international event. Did you have that sense of – I'm just curious, uh, that sense of history as you were stepping on the ice with these guys? And did you realize how big this all was to people in Canada and around the world? Well, you didn't realize right away. But when when the first game started, we certainly did. Uh, but like my – Bobby Hoare had been my idol growing up. And he was my defense partner in that camp because he was he was coming off knee surgery and and he wasn't probably wasn't going to be ready to play, but he was there at camp. So uh, he was my partner. He was number four, and I was number forty. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, for me that was just the highlight, probably or one of the highlights of my career to play with Bobby Orr. And, you know, just everywhere you went, he was just so revered. You know, not. You know, you go to Montreal, you go to Toronto, two of the hockey meccas in Canada. Uh, you know, he, he couldn't go anywhere without everybody knowing who he was. It was just, a, you know, that was amazing. And then, you know, we get into the first game and all of a sudden we're up 3 nothing, five minutes into the hockey game. And I said to Billy Harris, who was sitting beside me, I said, God, we may get a chance to play in this series. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and then, little did we know that that was the last goal we were going to score that game and we ended up losing the game 7-3 but uh, uh, you know it was, it was a great experience The Did you get a chance to play at all in Finland or Sweden or anywhere in, in between Canada and the Soviet Union? No, in that series? Yes. No, we uh, actually once the series reached Vancouver um, you know the training camps were starting and Montreal wanted me to come to training camp. Mm-hmm. So they, uh, you know, because I wasn't going to play in that series anyway at that point. I mean, uh, you know, they knew they were in for a fight. There was no way they were going to put a young player in that series. Uh, So Montreal, uh, they ended up giving me the money. And I think it was somewhere like $5,000 at the time. They gave me $5,000, said, here, John, we want you to come to training camp, but in the next summer you can go on vacation. (laughs) <laughs> and we'll pay for the trip. So that was a lot of money in 1972. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John, going back to my original question that I veered from for Team Canada, but now you're going, you have another unique experience because it's 1972, you're just a young guy. You're going to training camp with the Montreal Canadiens, uh, going against the, uh, going with the, you've had a little bit of a buffer because you played Team Canada. But tell me a little bit about that first camp as a Montreal Canadian. Well, you know, first first of all, you have to know that if growing up in Ontario, Montreal, Toronto, that was a hated rivalry. Right. <laughs> you know, that was a big change though. All of a sudden now I've played for the Montreal Canadiens. My parents had, and whole family had to change allegiance. But uh, <laughs> it was, uh, training camp was so totally different there. Um, you know, like it was just on the ice, you scrimmaged. I think that first year, we had like four teams for scrimmage, but each team had two lines and three defensemen, and mm-hmm. you scrimmage for an hour. Wow. You know, so you were constantly going, going. It was all about skating there, which suited me fine because that, that was kind of the strength of my game. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, as a young player, you think you're, you know, you know, you have a pretty good game and you think you're ready to play, and then you get against the types of players they had there. And it's like now it's kind of an eye-opener that how far behind you really are. Yeah, and that team, of course, would go on to win the Stanley Cup. And you also had a very strong team in Nova Scotia. I believe Al McNeil was your coach in year one. Uh, talk to me uh, a little bit about that first year as a Voyager. And I, I, you have an adjustment, too, because... 
it's a real grind. I mean, you're going now to the pro game, uh, the physicality of it, just the the number of games you play between playoffs and the regular season. You played uh, 80, 89 games that year. So, uh, how did how did that how did you adapt to that? And talk to me a little bit about that about year one as a Voyager. Well, actually, I didn't think it was that big of an adjustment. Uh, you know, again, as a young player. Uh, you're just going to play hockey. Mm-hmm, you know, like you don't think you're going, you don't think you're going to work. You're just, uh, you're just getting up. You go to the rink and pray. Your, your whole life is just hockey. Mm-hmm. You have no idea really what's going on in the real world. It's, you go, like I said, you go to the rink, you practice, uh, you know, go to lunch. I mean, the game was so much different than it is today. I mean, today there's so, so much training and nutrition and video. Like, we had none of those things. You know, you basically went to practice, and when practice was over, you were done for the day. Right. You didn't You didn't have any of the, the other things that you have today. We had a lot more downtime, and um, it was just a different world than it is today. You eventually get the call relatively early in your career, 73, 74, you get a chance to play a chunk of games for the Canadians that year. And I was curious if you remember, you have goal that year. Do you remember your first game and do you remember your first goal as a Hab? Actually, I do remember my first goal because um, a week or two prior to that, um, I, I scored my first goal on, on uh, I'm pretty sure it was Derek Grant from the Detroit Red Wings. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had played their farm team the week before, and he had been in net then. I had like six or seven shots on goal in that game, and I couldn't buy one. And, right. and then to get up to the NHL, I scored. I, I beat him on a slap shot high, far side, uh, on a power play. Um, so, I mean, you always want to score one top shelf as your, as your first goal. I mean, those, as a young kid, you, <laughs> nobody wants to score one along the ice or deflect it. I mean. <laughs> mm-hmm, right, exactly. I always tell guys that that, that I think Don Luce had a, a deflection of, uh, or something like that off his leg for his first goal or whatever. And hey, I said, "Hey, it wasn't on it wasn't on film, so you might as well tell you went went uh, end to end and went top shelf and and scored to tell the story." <laughs> but um, uh, John, you end eventually uh, you become more of an NHL regular in seventy five seventy six, which is the building of one of the greatest teams in the history of the sport. The Montreal Canadiens of the 1970s come together that year and begin their Stanley Cup run. Uh, You step into that lineup. I was curious of your reflections on the most notable player of that team, Guy Lafleur, who in the first three years uh, had, I guess would we say, disappointing results as he came out of junior highly touted and then just really uh really took off in that 75 76 season actually the year before he had a good year 75 76 he established himself as a top right wing in hockey talk to a little bit about Guy Lafleur his work habits what was he like to play with as a teammate well first of all he was a great guy great guy great teammate um you know he loved to play he uh great skater great shot um, you know, he would have been perfect for today's game. Right. You know, with with uh, you know, where a guy you couldn't hook and hold or interfere. Uh, you know, he was that type of player, just could really fly. And it it took him a while, really, to learn the league. I mean, he was a, a, a kid coming out of junior that was better than everybody else, and all of a sudden you get to pro hockey. And, and it's a lot harder to score. It's a lot more of a grind to score. Uh, so there was an adjustment for him coming up. But uh, once he got his confidence, and and the other thing is, like, when you're the first pick overall, you're a French-Canadian playing in Montreal, the pressure is enormous. Mm-hmm. And the media scrutiny and, um, you know, he was going to supposed to be the next Jean Beliveau, the next savior of the Canadians. And, and it was just too much for him right away. Right. You know, right. I, I think it took him a while to get his confidence and, and just feel comfortable with that burden. 
That's understandable. And now, you've, like I said, you have the big three on defense, Hirschvar, Guy Point, Larry Robinson. Uh, what was your role that year on, on the team? How did you fit in? What type of playing time did you get? And most importantly, John, because it, it comes into our story later on, what was it like playing for Scotty Bowman? Well, uh, you know, my playing time was okay. I ended up playing 45 games that year. Um, you know, in and out of the lineup, um, you know, and I, and I was a, an offensive guy, so I played the power play. I had a good shot. I could skate. Uh, but they had, you know, like Gila Point was a power play guy. Larry Robinson played some power play. Mm-hmm. I mean, my advantage was obviously I was a right-hand shot. Um, but, you know, we also had that year a couple of other young guys come in. Bill Nyrop came in. Rick Chartrock came in. Uh, we had uh, Don Ory was on defense. Pierre right. Bouchard was another defense. So we had, so we had like seven or eight guys around. Um, so, you know, I got to play pretty regular that year during the regular season. But then when the playoffs started, they started with a veteran lineup. You know, we won the f- first two rounds for, for nothing, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I never really got a chance to play. And then, you know, so I ended up playing no playoff games whatsoever. Right. Um, and neither did Don Ory. And right. it's kind of a shame. I, mean, I know you probably don't dwell on it, but it's kind of a shame that uh, that happened because you put a lot of effort into the season. You play a lot you're with the team uh, from beginning to the end, but you don't get your name on the Stanley Cup, nor did Don. Uh, and I had this conversation with him a couple of years back. Uh, is that a disappointment to you? Was that a, a because you know in subsequent years, like it seems like everybody in the organization gets a name on a cup. But back then, it was, you know, they had. I think they had a, a rule that if you didn't play in the playoffs, name didn't get on there. But uh, is that something that you look back at with disappointed that your name didn't get on there? You know what? Yeah, you. you you didn't think about it that much at the time because you thought there'd be other opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, now you look back on it and, you know, especially looking back and, and you see how many names are on there now, like oh. you mentioned, yeah. it is a bit of a disappointment, but you don't do it. I mean, I got the miniature Stanley cup. I got a, a Stanley cup ring. Um, so end of the day, I mean, those are the things that, that are, are the most obvious. I mean, how many people really look at the, at the Stanley Cup and look for the 1976 uh, Montreal Canadian team to see whose names are on there. So you know you're right. Um, you're right. Uh, the so you're with you're with you know as I said and as you know one of the great teams of all time and in 76 77 season uh, you're acquired by the Colorado Rockies. Now you're going from one extreme to the other. You're going from the best to a team on the lower rung. And I'm curious, as you become a Colorado Rocky, what's the feeling like in that? I mean, as, as far as the approach of the of your teammates, of, of the coaching, do you notice a significant difference right away? Well, first of all, when it was kind of, I had pressured my, it was the last year of my deal, and I, and I said, that, you know, because I'd only played 45 games, and there was so many young guys coming up. Right. You know, I said, hey, I need to play. I'm 25 years old. I need to play. And I want to go somewhere where I can play. Um, so I kind of forced their hand to trade me. And, and I probably would have got traded earlier, except I broke my wrist in training camp. Mm-hmm. And so I missed the first month of the season. But um, in hindsight, I look back at, t- at the time it was, I went from the best team to the worst team. Right. And, you know, in Montreal, I mean, everybody wants, wants to win, but in Montreal in those years, losing was not acceptable. You know, the fans didn't accept it. The players didn't, you know, the organization didn't, it was, it was just a totally different culture. And then you go to a market like Denver at that time, with a brand new first year team, there wasn't a uh, great fan interest and we were a bad team. Right. And it just kind of became where guys accepted losing. You know, the team had come over from, they were, had uh, come over from Kansas city. They were the scouts for a couple of years in Kansas city and then moved to Denver and became the Rockies. And you know, some of the players that 
losing had been accepted. And, you know, like I said, you went from uh, being, you know, with the Montreal Canadiens, who were the New York Yankees, basically, of hockey Mm -hmm. at the time. And you go to a franchise where it's losing is or winning isn't that important. You know, like it's losing was acceptable. And it was it was a very, very devastating and a little demoralizing uh, going to the rink every day. It took a lot of the fun out of the game. That's interesting. I was going to ask you that specific question. You're a young guy, you're a hardworking player, but as it, uh, my question was, do you does it wear on you? Even if you're a pro, you're a human being, and you know you go out there. Let's say there's six thousand people in the seats. The team's on a, on a on a tough stretch. Is it tough to get motivated to play at your best when you're seeing that type of environment consistently? Obviously, you're gonna get out there and work hard, but is, is it difficult to play intensely under those circumstances? Well, it, it it's always hard, and it's harder. Like when you're not in the game, but you know, like it's one thing if you're playing on a team and you're there, you're right on the edge every night, you're battling for to win the game. But if you're out of the game or always early, or you know, you, you really don't feel like you have a chance, like you, you're not staying in the game, right. you're just kind of going with the flow. Where if like you look at teams now in the NHL because everything and the little the parody, everything's so close, oh, yeah. teams are in the game all the time. So you're battling right to the end, scratching and clawing. But if you're out of games, you're just kind of trying playing to get the game over with. It's interesting. You know, and yeah. that year, my first game in uh, uh, Colorado, I ended up getting hit and guy falling over my knee and I tore a cartilage. Wow, so your I first tried game. playing with a torn cartilage for my first game. So I tried playing with a torn cartilage for a couple months, and it just kept getting worse. So finally I had to get surgery. And, you know, back then uh, it was the old-fashioned way where they had to open you up, and it was I was out for six weeks. So, um, you know, it was, a, it was a tough start. Yeah, it's a miserable start. But the next season, 77-78, this team is still struggling. However, you have your, your your first breakout year, one of many in your career where you uh, scored a lot of points, 54 points from the blue line, and you're joined. You, you are 2-3 in scoring on that team with a young uh, rookie at that time, Barry Beck. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that season, your first year to really show what you can do in the NHL and what difference it, it made to have Barry Beck come into the scene. Well, I think... You know the big big difference is, uh, you know we we had kind of an anchor on our team, Barry Beck. Even though he was a rookie, uh, you know he was a phenomenal player, and it it gave us a little bit more credibility as a team. And and certainly he was a building block on our team. Uh, you know I was fortunate enough to be his partner and get to play with him. Oh really? Um, yeah. You know we, like we had a lot of other good players on our team, like uh, Paul Gardner, Mike Kitchen, Wolf Paymont. Right. Um, right. You know, so we had the, the beginnings of some good prospects and some good players. Um, you know, but we were, we were still a little bit of a floundering franchise trying to find our way, uh, you know, in a market that, you know, still wasn't really a hockey market. Um, you know, if we, we couldn't get any traction to get enough winning, um, but it was we were moving in the right direction. Hey, you sure were. You know, I talked to uh, Freddie Ahern recently. We talked a little bit about the fact you guys made the playoffs in 1978, and I was able to find a, a, a clip online. Actually, the clip starts with you. It's in Philadelphia and ends up with a goal by Dennis Duperry, who as you know, passed away recently. And I was curious of your memories and recollections of, of Dennis. Well, you know what? Dennis was a very good veteran player. You know, a uh, smart player. I think his skill set was a little underrated. Um, but, you know, good teammate, worked hard, un- you know, competed hard. You know, like, you know, what can I say? He was a good pro. Uh, do you get traded eventually, John, 
for no less than René Robert of the French Connection fame. And you kind of go back to another extreme again because you leave a, a Rockies team that's still trying to get a foothold and you come to a Buffalo Sabres team that is very good and uh, very well established and loaded with a lot of uh, top rated stars in the league, not the least of which is Gilbert Perot. And you're reunited with Scotty Bowman. So what was your reaction on getting traded to, from Colorado to Buffalo and how did that all transpire? Well, first of all, I was shocked, uh, you know, because I had played for Scotty in Montreal. I was like, well, hey, he didn't play me in Montreal. You know, why is he trading for me all of a sudden now? <laughs> right. uh, but I knew Scotty had liked me when I played for Montreal. I mean, just I just wasn't, you know, good enough to really help that team. They didn't need me. They needed guys. Uh, you know, their team was lacking in physicality and a little bigger or some size size um, so I, I was surprised but I remember we went to, went to Rochester to play an exhibition game against uh, Buffalo in the preseason and that was the year Don Cherry had come to Colorado to be the coach right and I, I was talking to Scotty before the game he was kind of quizzing me and you know Don Cherry uh, came to me before the game and said, hey, you better have a good game now. He said, Scotty, he's, he's trying hard to get you. <laughs> and so uh, the next day, I ended up getting traded. So, you know, it was, it was, a, uh, it was a weird situation because, you know, Randy Robert and the French Connection were revered in, in Buffalo and to as uh, for a player to go in there and try and replace Brentville, I mean, it wasn't a very popular trade uh, the first few weeks of, of the season, for sure. Right, and you end up with a, with a strong season. You were a plus 40 that year, um, and the Sabres have a strong team. I was curious, I went back to a question I asked you, uh, I forgot to ask you previously. What was Scotty Bowman like to, I, I've heard so many stories, in fact, I just talked to, uh, to Phil Bork, and he was telling me a little bit about uh, Scotty Bowman as, as a coach of the Penguins. I was curious, what was he? he was, Scotty's kind of a mysterious guy, and maybe he wasn't that close to the players. But what type of a coach was he, and how did you get along with him as a player? Well, I got along fine with Scotty, um, but Scotty was a guy that, that he he was masterful at getting into your head, and he knew which buttons to push, which guys he could get on and not lose and which guys, you know, he had to leave alone. Um, so he, he knew he owned me. Like he, he was in my head all the time and he knew that I, you know, that I always felt like I had to prove myself every time I played. Um, so, and he knew that I was going to be hard working at practice that I'd love to come to the rink, love to play. So, uh, he didn't get on me a lot, uh, but uh, you know, he always wondered with Scotty, he's like, why? Why is he always nitpicking at little things? You know, because it doesn't mm -hmm. seem like it's that important when you're a player. But later on, when I became a coach, I realized that if you let the little things slide, they all become big things. Right. Like, at what point do you start? If being one minute late is acceptable, well, then what's wrong with the guy that was only two minutes late? Exactly. You know, it has a snowball. It has a snowball effect. So, um, like Scotty was perfect at when he, that year we had Scotty, Roger Nielsen, Jimmy Roberts. Scotty did. He was also a GM, so he did all the games, and he'd come to practice once in a while, but not that often. Roger Nielsen was he. Uh, he ran all the practices and. And he prepared you for every situation. Like, though, you worked out things in practice that could, would arise in a game. You were prepared. Mm -hmm. um, but it was much less stressful at practice. If Scotty showed up at practice, it was stressful. Mm -hmm. I mean, guys were on eggshells, especially the young players. You know, because you never knew when he was going to go off on somebody. And, uh you know, he knew how to get everybody's attention, and he always kept you on edge. So, man, it's, it's hard for players to, to do that over the course of a whole year. So, 
when he stayed away from practice, it was much, much less uh, stressful. And Jimmy Roberts was the other guy who would just finish playing. He kept the guys loose. You know, he was kind of like the big brother. Uh, he is the guy everybody could go to and um, kind of he'd help you through things. And we had some young players, Lindy Rob, Mike Ramsey, you know, Larry Playfair. We had a lot of kids out here that um, came in. But it was, so it was, kind of, it was a perfect scenario. Yeah, it really worked out for you as well. And you had some, especially for a defenseman, some incredibly – Productive offensive seasons of uh, 80, 81, 69 points the following year, 68 points in just 69 games. In general, that, that's a very strong Buffalo team. You weren't able to uh, take it deeper into the playoffs as you would have liked to. But when you look back at your career as a Sabre, first of all, I think you benefited from some great coaching, which would come down to help you later on in life. But playing in Buffalo, playing with that team, with those talented guys, uh, if you look back at your career as a Sabre, uh, what are your best memories of that stretch of time in your career? Well, you know what? That, that team um, was by far the closest team I'd ever played on. I mean, it was like a family. And, and I think it started because those guys like Sean Fell, Martin, Robert, Ramsey, Luz, they had all come in together as young players. Mm-hmm. You know, they'd all grown with that organization together. And they were like a family, you know, the wives, the girlfriends, everybody had, had kind of started there. And um, it, was a, it was a close-knit team. It was fun to play for, and it was a great group of guys to be in with. I mean, as you know, Buffalo is a great, a great town. Uh, it's not a huge city, but their fans are diehard. Um, and also it was... It was a great experience. We we ended up getting beat in the semifinals by an Islander to uh, went on to win four Stanley Cups. But you know, I, I think a little bit because that was Scotty's first year in in Buffalo, and, and we had a chance to finish first and finish ahead of Montreal, mm-hmm. and we kind of were pushing from January on. We were kind of pushing to finish first and finish ahead of Montreal, and I think we burned ourselves out a little bit. We we didn't have another level that we could get to when the playoffs started. Interesting. You know, we, we didn't have a lot left in the tank, and I think, you know, looking back, uh, you know, we probably put our foot on the gas a little too early. Just simply when I was talking to Paul Gardner, uh, when you look at your career, you have your peak years. I mean, you have great years in 80, 80 81, 81, 82. Um, 82, 83, you're playing less. What happened in between those, those years? Uh, it's, it's, it's hard at the time to understand, and when I look back at it, uh, I never really got to the story because obviously you were you're still young, still playing well. Um, what happened in Buffalo, and how did that all transpire? Well, one one of the big things was that Phil Housley and, and Anna Verda both came into Buffalo and were playing a similar style as I was. And, you know, kind of, so, you know, Phil came in, guns blazing in that first. And then I was also having that knee injury I had in 76. Um, I had another one uh, in off season training in 78. I tore my anterior cruciate ligament, which they they didn't repair. They said I didn't need it. Hmm. Uh, but I was with Colorado still. And so I was starting to have some knee problems. And then, um, so that year, my ice time got cut a little bit. I was starting to have some knee problems. The following year, I ended up getting picked up by Quebec in the waiver draft. Before the season started, I hurt my knee again in Quebec. That summer, I had the doctor, you know, looked at it and said, hey, I can clean it out and give you a couple more years. So I had it cleaned out, tried to rehab, and kind of it wouldn't rehab. And went back to the doctor and said, hey, what can I tell you? Your knee's shot. You know, I think you're done. So... Um, but, My career kind of ended prematurely. 
It did. It ended prematurely and, and abruptly. And my, I was curious how. I when I when I talk to players who have had that similar situation, it's sometimes going to be a very difficult adjustment because you've gone to again. It wasn't like you had this slow wind down to your career. You were playing really really well, and now all of a sudden you're incapable of playing at that level, and you're looking at the end of your career. What type of an adjustment is that for you psychologically? Uh, making that leap from doing something you've done every single day and done at the highest level to all of a sudden uh, now no longer a hockey player. How, how did that? How did that transpire for you from a psychological level? Well, the first thing is I you know I, I got married the. The summer before I got picked up, or that summer before I got picked up by Quebec, and the next summer, you know, my wife was expecting. So I went from, you know, playing hockey to all of a sudden, and no responsibility, all of a sudden being married, having a child on the way, <laughs> and not knowing if I could ever play again. Now, you know, after my year in, in Quebec, they ended up buying out the last year of my contract. So then I... I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I, uh, I talked to Scotty about, a, you know, maybe a possibility of assistant coaching job with Buffalo. And you know, I was talking to Hockey Night Canada, possibly doing some, you know, color work. Mm -hmm. And then Scotty called me in the summer and said, hey, I'd like you to play one more year. You know, um, you know go down to, I'd like you to go to Rochester, be player assistant coach. And, you know, the way you can get your foot in the door, if we, in coaching, if we have some injuries, you get a chance to, you know, up you for depth. So I said, okay, Scotty was looking to get an assistant coach in Buffalo. He couldn't, you know, he was been talking to Bob McCammon. He couldn't get Bob to come without it. Bob wanted to guarantee that he was going to be able to get the head coach when Scotty stepped down. So mm -hmm. he ended up bringing up Joe Crozier from, um, Rochester as an assistant coach, and he called Jim Schoenfeld, who had been my playing partner in Buffalo and had retired that summer from the Bruins, uh, became the head coach. So I was player, supposed to be player assistant coach in Rochester, and Shoney was going to be the head coach. Well, then um, my, when my knee wouldn't rehab, I went to training camp, I tried practicing, and it was just, it would swell up. So I just couldn't even go on the ice. So then I, during training camp, I was just an assistant coach. I tried the season to, to play, and you know, it kept getting worse. I got another opinion, you know, the same result, hey, you're done, bite the bullet. So Buffalo had a lot of injuries early on in the year, and they were short of defense. Well, 17 games into the season, Shoney ends up coming, going back to playing. Oh, yeah, yeah. He goes back up. He goes back and plays. And you know what? I may have my numbers wrong, maybe 27 games into the season, something like that. But he goes back and plays, and I take over as head coach in Rochester. And then the next year, Shoney took over as head coach in Buffalo. And I, so I stayed in Rochester for uh, six years as the head coach. And then uh, Rick Dudley was the coach in Buffalo and wanted me to come up and be an assistant. And, I, you know, I said, well, I don't know. Anyway, he talked me into coming up. And Donnie Lieber and I flipped, switched positions. He went to Rochester. I went to Buffalo. And I was an assistant there for a couple of years. Then John Buckler came in. Rick got fired. Donnie and I switched back. I went back to Rochester for three more years. Um, that's kind of how it happened. Yeah, it was an extremely successful run. Not a lot of coaches uh, last in an organization for as long as you did with Rochester. A little in between with Buffalo there, as you mentioned. I wanted to just quickly talk about 86-87. You uh, win the Calder Trophy. It called her Cup, and I uh, believe you beat uh, Sherbrooke in seven games. 
to win that. What are your, you get Jody Gage, Ray Shepard, uh, a big moment in Rochester Americans history. Talk a little bit about that, that playoff run and, and winning that thing in game seven. Well, it was uh, a little weird. You know, we, we started out the series really well, and I believe we lost game six or game yeah, we lost. Yeah, you were down three two. Five. We yeah. had to win game. Three. Yeah, we had to win game six at home, and then we had to go back to Sherbrooke to win game seven. Um, and you know what? We we had had we had a lot of good players. We had you know guys, a lot of veteran character guys like Jack Brownshido, uh, Donnie Lever played on that team. Uh, Ray Shepard, Richie Dunn, Darren Poopa was our goaltender. Mm-hmm. Darcy Wakalak was the other goaltender. Uh, you know, we had some good prospects: Mikel Anderson, uh, Ray Shepard, Bobby Halkitas, Sean Anderson. Uh, Yui Krupp was on that team. So we had a lot of good players that went on to have pretty good NHL careers, and and some veteran guys who had had pretty good careers, like Jody Gage, Gates Orlando. It's a great community up there in Rochester. Uh, the obviously a place that you know extremely well. Uh, so you go from kind of a a community like Rochester, you end up in, in Los Angeles in the in the IHL. The IHL for the fans who don't remember at that period of time had a lot of it was not not a pure development league. You had a lot of uh, young players, but you also had a lot of veterans. Kind of a hybrid between the NHL and the AHL. How did you end up in Long Beach with the Ice Dogs and uh, actually in Los Angeles to start out and then off to Long Beach? It's an interesting place to play hockey. I was just curious about your experience there. Well, what happened was. When I, when I went back from uh, Buffalo to Rochester, and then John Muckler ended up taking over as GM in Buffalo. Well, when I was working with Rick Dudley prior to that, John Tortorella was the other assistant coach. So it was Rick Dudley, myself, and John Tortorella. Mm-hmm. And then when Muckler came in and took over as head coach, was, I was the associate coach, and John Tortorella was the assistant. And... So when I went back to Rochester, John stayed there, and I I knew that uh, our that Muckler wanted to get John Tortorella some bench time. So I my contract was ending in Rochester, and I knew that that I probably wasn't going to be back. Well, Rick Dudley, who had gone to the I and was in uh, coaching in Phoenix, and uh, Donnie Waddell, who was the GM in San Diego which ended up becoming Fred Comrie uh, was the owner there. He was moving the team to L.A., but Donnie was going to Orlando. Well, uh, Rick and Donnie both recommended me for the GM coaching job in in L.A. So that's I end up, up going out and interviewing. And uh, so I had told the, the owner, Steve Donner in Rochester, that, hey, you know, like, I know that Mucker wants to get Tortorella in here, so I'm I'm going to leave on my own terms, and that was how I, why I ended up leaving and going out there. Yeah, you mentioned John Tortorella. For fans who know him now, as a two-time NHL coach, the Air Stanley Cup winner, what was he like as a young coach back then? Well, he was. I mean, you know what? It was similar to to the way he is. I, like John never really ever, he didn't like the media. Uh, you know, he just, he, he always had a tough time. You know, I like to say suffering fools or somebody who would ask a dumb question. Uh, you know, he just never really, uh, never really liked to play that game. You end up uh, back with the Kings uh, for a couple of years from your, your stretch at Long Beach where you have some tremendous seasons, uh, a, a few, uh, a couple seasons, 50 wins and up, uh, playing in Long Beach. And I had, pardon my ignorance, but uh, what rink did you play in and what type of fan support did you have with the Long Beach Ice Dogs? No, we played in the Long Beach Arena, which is right along the Pacific Ocean. Wow. Uh, in, by the Long Beach Harbor. And actually, our slogan was hockey at the beach. You know, it was, uh, 
it was a it was a very cool place to play. The problem was you know, we were in a major metropolitan market playing with a minor league team. We're, we're basically we're on the Pacific Ocean on the west of us, so that means we can only draw fans from the north, uh, north, east, and south. Well. You know, the north, or the north of us was Palos Verde. It's a very high-end rent, rent district part of L.A. And, uh, you know, the, the south was more of a beach community. So you had to go almost 10 miles inland before we really started drawing any families and the type of uh, demographics that fit minor league sports. Right. So it was a hard sell, and, and we really... The, the times we drew well were when we had giveaways and promotional nights and able to work and get a lot of groups in. And so we did have some really big crowds, but we had weeknights were sparse. Yeah, it's a challenge. You know, I had the, uh, I actually worked with Jimmy Schoenfeld and I managed the. Um, Hartford Wolfpack slash Connecticut Whale in the American Hockey League uh, several years ago. And that's always the. It's always the thing in the American League and the International League is, you know, the, the weekends, you, you feel pretty good. Weekends after after Thanksgiving, you're going to do okay. It's it's those midweek games. You wish you never had them uh, because they're almost impossible to to populate the arena on a on a Tuesday night in November in, in the minor leagues. But, but, John, I wanted to ask you about your decision to uh, go to Switzerland. And I talked to one of our first guests on the show is a guy named Norm Bowden, who uh, went over right around when, when Jacques Lemaire went over to, to Switzerland. Uh, what influenced your decision to go overseas and, uh, and move? I'm assuming you moved your entire family over there. And what type of experience was that? And why did you make that choice? Well, uh, first of all, the, my family didn't go over with me because I had a son who was playing junior hockey in the BC Junior League mm-hmm. uh, for uh, Salmon Arm. And my daughter was playing college softball at Cal State Fullerton. Oh, wow. And my wife, my wife was a flight attendant, so she was still working. And, and, you know, one, she was working. Two, she wanted to see my daughter play softball. Three, she wanted to see her son play uh, hockey. So I was over there by myself for parts of nine years. Seven years, sorry, seven years. Mm-hmm. So it was a, you know, it got a little lonely at the end, but I went over because... Um, my family was older, and, you know, I knew I didn't have to uproot them. Um, and I, I'd had offers uh, previously to go over, but I had young kids at home, and I didn't really want to uproot them at the time, and they were playing sports. So uh, I, I just felt that it was, it might be the time in my life to try a new experience. And so, um, yeah, so what type of experience was that? I mean, it had culturally, uh, just an, an, it just it, it, the the schedule. What type of practices? In other words, it's an entirely different approach that you're taking coaching in North American pro. I'm assuming. Well, it, it, first of all, Switzerland's a fabulous country. Everywhere you go, it's like you're seeing uh, uh, vistas and sights that you know. Hey, that could be on a postcard. That could be on a postcard. <laughs> right. It was beautiful. You know, the people are wonderful. You, When you get there, you feel like you step back in time about 50 years. You know, like Bern is a, is a uh, smaller city. It's only about, uh, you know, to a couple hundred thousand people. The, the hockey is, they're fanatics. I mean, they, the building holds 17,000. There's only 4,000 seats. The rest of them are standing spots and they're all on one side. Wow. So you have 12, 13,000 people facing you standing, singing off the whole game. Um, so, the, you know, that the, the uh, fan support was phenomenal. But when you're an import and you're important, you know, the expectations, you're there to win. You know, you have to win, especially in Bern. And the, it was a huge change in the mentality of when I when I first went. When you come from the NHL, you're, everything's geared about the games. 
you're in game mode almost from the first day of the regular season through the through the season. I mean, very rarely do you practice. And on mm-hmm. where over there, you they the first year they played forty four games. So the, there was tw- it's a twelve team league. You played each team four times, and the way it worked was you play. You have round one, round two, round three, round four. So you play the other. Uh, you play eleven those eleven team other teams each before you play your second game against the team. So you've gone through the schedule once against them. Then you play them in reverse order the next time. Then same thing, reverse order again, until you've played them four times during the course of the season. But over there, they have, the, like the national teams are very important. And right. the world championships, is basically, that's their Stanley Cup. I mean, certainly the league championship is important. But the world championships are huge in Europe. So that means their schedule has to be done before the world championship. But at the same time, they have three times during the year where they have, it's called a national team break, where players will get together. Um, They have the major, which is um, Russia, Finland, Sweden, and the Czech Republic. Those four teams get together three times a year and play a tournament. Then you have uh, Switzerland, Slovakia, Germany, and France at that time, mm-hmm. where the uh, the next four teams, they would play a tournament. So you, in November, you would have a national team break. December, late December, you would have one. And then in early, just three or four games before the playoffs would start, you'd have another one. And those were 10, 10 a day breaks. Wow. So, and so the national team does, and being in Bern, we had four or five players always that were on the national team. And the, the junior teams do the same thing because they're getting ready for the world, you know, the junior championship. Right. That, that is played during the winter. So your junior team would get together. So you could lose seven, eight, ten players for ten days at a time. And you're trying to run practices now without those players. Plus, in, uh, at Christmas time, they have the Spangler Cup. where So the league shuts down during the Spangler Cup as well. Wow. So you have another week that you're just practicing. So it was, there was a lot of stopping and starting. Not only you only played two games a week, and most times they were either Friday, Saturday, Friday, Sunday. They were weekend games. Very rarely did you ever play a midweek game. So it, you know, it was like you never got any continuity. It was like you get your team rolling for a couple games, then you're off for a week of practicing, or you know you'd be off for a week where. Yet, or 10 days where so you couldn't practice every day. You get players a few days off, practice a few days, they come four days off. So there was a lot more uh, practice mode than playing mode. Right. Well, you had that credibility from your career, of course, as a coach and a player, and your record. Uh, you know, you're always in the uh, <laughs> uh, your average. I'm looking at your 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 stats here. You, you probably won uh, 75 percent of your your games here uh, in in Switzerland. I was curious, what's the caliber of play? If you had to compare, like Swiss A League, you're coaching Bern. Uh, what is that comparable in North America? It would be very comparable to the American Hockey League. Right. And uh, the, the difference being that the, Ameri- the physicality of the American Hockey League would end up winning out. But like for an American League team to go over and play on the big ice in Switzerland, the Swiss teams could more than hold their own. As I said, you had a, a, a lot of success there. When you look back at your coaching career, John, you know, we talked a little bit about Scotty Bowman and Roger Nielsen. You had your own coaching style, but 
who would you most, uh, the coaches who coach you, I guess you might be a combination of, of a bunch, but who would you compare yourself most to? Who did you learn the most, most from and emulate your coaching career as, uh, as a head coach? Well, you know what? I was probably, uh, Scotty Bowman had the most influence on me, obviously, because I was with him for almost nine years. Mm-hmm. Um, so he he, I, he would be the number one person I would say had the biggest influence on me. Um, you know, and if I had to do it again, I wish I could have started as an assistant coach working for a Roger Nielsen type of guy um, who was somebody that was very detailed, very organized. I mean, I kind of went right from playing to coaching. Yes. Um, you know, and I wasn't an organized guy. I was you're kind of, you're doing things, but you're jumping around a little bit. And, you know, I was very fortunate early on in my career to have some really good veteran players, uh, like the Jody Cages, like the Paul Gardners. Um, you know, because I was an emotional guy. I, I, I put a lot of energy into every game. I was involved in the game. I was wired. Um, you know, I, some nights I felt like I had played the game. <laughs> right. I was, I was so spent after the game was over. Um, you know, and, uh, but I was, like I said, I was lucky that I had some good veterans that kind of, you know, could tolerate me early on and I was able to survive or else I probably would have got canned early and never resurfaced. Well, it was a a heck of a career, and I know you've gone overtime with us tonight, and I greatly appreciate it. I have one question I I failed to ask you earlier, but hockey was, when you were a young kid coming into the NHL, hockey had changed dramatically because of expansion, the World Hockey Association, and intimidation becomes a part of the game. Uh, Broad street bullies and, you know, name, you know, go on and on. You obviously had, and you've probably answered the question multiple times about uh, the scrap with Dave Schultz. You kind of get suckered, and uh, I I had a similar question I asked to Paul Gardner when he got hit from behind by Jimmy Mann, and I had a similar conversation with Brian Propp, who got you know cheap shotted by by Chris Chelios. You're a young guy. You're playing. You're in that circumstance. did that affect you at all going forward? I mean, without going too much into the details of of the fight, um, but that's a nationally televised game. You're a young guy. It's a tough position to be in. How did you respond to that, and how did that affect you, if at all, going forward? Wow. I don't think it affected me that much. Uh, the problem was it was my own fault in my own way because I had been playing in Halifax. I, that was only like my third game up. And, you know, playing, we had been taking boxing lessons with Al McNeil, you know, uh, just getting some confidence. And, and the, you know, the Flyers had, um, were, had been just kind of coming into their own and the Broad Street Bullies were taking hold. And the game was changing a little bit. And Montreal really didn't have a lot of toughness at the time. And I thought, well, you know, like, hey, if I, you know, get in a fight here and do good, you know, like I could probably – you know, make myself a home for myself on the team. Mm-hmm. So I would, I had kind of, um, the play had come down and I had given Billy Barber a shot. And there was a delayed penalty on me. Well, then Barber ended up going off when Schultz came on the ice. And so he came to the front of the net and, you know, I, I kind of gave the shot and I figured he was going to push me back and we drop our gloves and go. Well, he ended up dropping one glove and he drilled me, and that was end of the story. You know, and I remember he, and I'm on my ass, and uh, Neil Armstrong was the linesman. He goes, "Stay down, <laughs> I look at him, I said, "Hey, Neil, where do you want me to go? You know, where do you think I'm going to go?" So, uh, you know, then I, I kind of realized then that maybe being a fighter wasn't my calling card. Well, you picked the so, number. You picked the number one guy. You know, the four hundred and seventy-two penalty, penalty minute guy to get started with. So I give you credit for that for jumping right into the deep end of the pool. Yeah, well, it wasn't my best 
decision in my career, let's put it that way. I did have one, one last question about that, though. Now, you came back in that game and, and played. I know the, there was no such thing as a concussion protocol back there. Did you was that? Did you get a concussion from that or any type of injury from, from that, that hit? Because he had his hands taped. Uh, but did you come back in that game, and did you suffer, do you think, a concussion? No, I don't think so. Um, you know, I, you know what? I, I had lots of concussions, or I had concussions later on where, you know, like you got hit hard a few times and you knew, you know, now you know you have a concussion. Back then, there was always kind of that written code, never let the other team know you're hurt. You know, right. no matter what, you got to call, get to the bench. <laughs> Don't make the trainer come out on the ice. That was probably the most embarrassing thing that could happen in the trainer had to come and help you off. Right. So it was it was just a totally different mentality. Um, you know, it, it, we weren't making a lot of money, and we were teams didn't have a big investment in us, so we were we weren't a a, a valuable asset, let's say, to the team. There was less teams. There was lots of players. Um, we were all replaceable parts, and um, you know the last thing as a player you wanted, you didn't want to get hurt and give another guy a chance to come in and, and take your spot. Right, because exactly. it wasn't being saved for you. Well, John, you. They had one heck of a career, both as a player and, like I said, a long career, a lot of wins as, as a coach. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time tonight. I know we went a little longer than uh, anticipated, but it was worth it. You were very entertaining. Uh, happy uh, happy trails. Have a good trip. And um, we thank you so much for spending the time with us tonight, John. Hey, Marcus, my pleasure. Thank right. you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast. Be sure to visit us at ProHockeyAlumni.org.